All right. Well, recently it's been said by some people that a many of the words in the New Testament, words that are unique to the New Testament and unique to Christianity are simply metaphors, that they're not literally true. Uh, it's been said that words like born again, um, or citizens of heaven, uh, incorruptible seed, sealed with Holy Spirit, children of God, sons of God, that these are metaphors and that they're not literally true. And in fact, I was discussing this with a friend um, and, and I, you know, he was saying that, you know, these words are, um, that he says they're metaphors and he's downplaying their, their meaning and their importance and significance, you know, that they're not that significant, uh, they're not that literal, uh, that type of feeling was coming from him. And I said, okay, um, all right, let's just pretend. I, I don't believe they're metaphors. Some of them might be. Some of them could be categorized as metaphors. But um, let's just pretend that they are. They're all metaphors. All of them are just metaphors. Um, and if they are, so what? That was my question. If they're metaphors, so what? Because <coughs> um, if they're metaphors, if, the, if those words are metaphors, then so is the word father. When, when uh, the scriptures uses the word father of uh, referring to God, then that's a metaphor also because it's in the same vein. Don't get too confused. I'll get there. <laughs> so that's what I came back with. All right. And he's kind of nodded, yeah. I said, so what is a metaphor for? What's the purpose of a metaphor? Let's just pretend they're all metaphors. Being born again is metaphors. Uh, what is the purpose of a metaphor? And I went to E.W. Bollinger, who's the master on figures of speech. No one has ever compiled anything like his book on figures of speech used in the Bible. Um, and I want to read to you, but please don't get bored by this. Uh, sometimes when you read out of a book, I know it can be very boring, but I'm going to read you a couple things out of his introduction and his uh, note on, on the figures of speech in general, and then read to you what he says about metaphors. Uh, Bunger said, writes, a figure is simply a word or a sentence thrown into a particular form different from its original or simplest meaning or use. These forms are consistently used by every speaker and writer. It is impossible to hold the simplest conversation or to write a few sentences without it or without. It may be unconsciously making use of figures um, and it might be conscious. We may say the ground needs rain. That is plain, cold, matter of fact statement. But if we say that the ground is thirsty, we immediately use a figure. It is not true to fact because the, the ground doesn't have a mouth, right? And therefore it must be a figure, but how true to feeling it is. That's a real key to, in figures of speech. How true to feeling is it when you say the ground is thirsty versus uh, the ground is dry, you know? Uh, it may be asked, how are we to know then when words are to be taken in their simple original form, i.e. literally, and when they are to be taken in some other and particular or peculiar form uh, as a figure? The answer is that whenever and wherever it is possible for the words of scripture are to be understood literally, but when a statement appears to be contrary to our experience or to known fact or revealed truth or seems to be at variance with the general teaching of the scriptures, then we may reasonably re expect that some figure is employed and as it is employed only to call our attention to some specially designed emphasis 
we are at once bound to diligently examine the figure for the purpose of discovering and learning the truth that is thus emphasized. Figures of speech emphasize what is being said. They draw attention to it. They, uh, they make it bigger than big. When you say that the ground is dry, you know, it's a cold, hard statement of fact. The ground's dry. But when you say it's thirsty, you know what it's like to thirst. You know what that feels like when your mouth is parched, when your body's screaming for water. You know what that's like. That's what you are, you are emphasizing that feeling. You're emphasizing that fact when you use a figure of speech. Um, so if they are metaphors, then you're making my point for me. If they are a figure of speech, God is now emphasizing what it is that he's saying. All right? Under metaphor, or Bollinger calls it representation, a declaration that one thing is or represents another, or it can be called comparison by representation. Metaphor. Hence, while a simile generally states that one thing is like or resembles another, the metaphor boldly and warmly declares that one thing is another. The metaphor is, therefore, is not so true to fact as, it is, as a simile is, but it is much more truer to feeling, to the, to the feeling of what it's saying. Let it be clearly understood that a metaphor is confined to a distinct affirmation that one thing is another thing owing to some association or connection in the uses or effects of anything expressed or understood. The two nouns themselves must both be mentioned and are always to be taken in their absolutely literal sense or else no one can tell what they mean. For example, all flesh is grass. The Bible says that. Here the word flesh is to be taken literally as the as the subject spoken of. And grass is to be taken equally literally as that which represents flesh. Understand, the, they're, they're literal. All the figure lies in the verb is. This, this statement is made under strong feeling, the mind uh, realizing some point of association, but instead of using the more measured verb resembles, or is like, which would be truer to fact, though not so true to feeling. The verb is, is used, and the meaning of the one thing is carried across and transferred to the other thing. Follow that? The meaning of the one thing is transferred, carried over to the meaning of the other thing. In other words, flesh is as grass, right? Flesh, all flesh is grass. The, the meaning of grass is carried over to the meaning of flesh. Grass, it withers away. You know, it dries up. It grows, it dies. So does flesh. That's what he's saying in that verse when he says all flesh is grass. It is therefore more easy to discern a metaphor in the New Testament than the Old. Uh, in the latter, the Old Testament, we have to be guided by what is true to fact and what is true only to feeling. If we distinguish between these, we shall not fail to see what is a statement of fact and what is a metaphor. For instance, in Psalm 23, where it says, the Lord is my shepherd, that's a metaphor. No, it's a metaphor. But what is he, what is God uh, emphasizing? He's emphasizing the attributes of a shepherd and, and equating those to the attributes of the Lord, that the Lord is acts as a shepherd for us. It's, metaphors are very simple. So what if all of these words are metaphors? What If they're metaphors, great, because now God's emphasizing the fact that we're children of God, sons of God, born again. He's emphasizing that, and he's taking those attributes of those words and transferring them to you, okay? So let's look at a couple of scriptures. Ephesians chapter 1. Um, 
is there, let me ask this, is there any questions thus far? Yes, I have a okay. lot. Would you like oh. me to, to the end? Um, maybe <laughs> that would be best <laughs> yeah. if there's a lot of them. But hopefully I've made this, un I've, I've explained what figures are for, they emphasize, and how a metaphor works. It's just transferring attributes from the one noun to the other. But it takes, it's taking that, so we know that flesh is not grass. Right. Right? That's a contradiction. But right. it's taking the quality of, about flesh and the quality about grass which, which they share, which it's, is the, is the uh, corruptibility. Correct. So flesh is corruptible, grass is corruptible. And when you say flesh is grass, then you're emphasizing that quality that they both share. Very well now, said. Nobody is trying to say that flesh and grass are the same thing. Right. But they do share this special quality that we're emphasizing with the metaphor. Well said. Better said than I said it. But I, I think that everybody knows that grass is perishable. Yes. And so it, it's, not, it's not necessarily saying that, that that both have the same. I think it's as Dennis said earlier that it, it's applying the characteristics of grass, which everybody knows is perishable, over to flesh. And it just helps us to see what flesh really is. It, I mean, do you see this? There's a slight difference. Yeah, I mean, that, it's carrying, it's taking the attributes of one and transferring those attributes to another. Right. Within the context, of what's being said, not all, uh, not all attributes. Obviously, flesh flesh is not green. You know, um, uh, you know, there's one. Uh, you know, but, he, but he's trying to make a point about flesh. He's yes. not trying to make a point about grass. Correct. Correct. So, Ephesians chapter one. Let's let's go here, and hopefully this clarifies I, i'm hoping but uh, like i said if sons of god and children of god if that's a metaphor then father is a metaphor by logic correct um but does that mean that it's any less than what we already understand that to mean i don't think so in ephesians chapter 1 verse 1 paul an apostle of jesus christ by the will of god to the holy faithful one, and faithful ones in Christ Jesus in Ephesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is either literally true that God is literally our Father, or it's figuratively true that God is our Father. And if it's figuratively true, what is, what it, is this saying? If this is a metaphor, what is it saying? It's taking the attributes of a father, right? The way that in every one of us knows what, a, what it's like to have a father. We all know what a father is like. Uh, or, and we've been fathers, many of us, and, and mothers too. So we understand that parental, familial um, connection that we have with children and that we've had with our parents. So it's those, it's those attributes that are being taken and applied to God so that you and I can understand our relationship with him. Or it's literally true that he's our father, which is what I believe. I, I do believe that most of these that are being called metaphors are literally true, but I'm granting to them, okay, it's a metaphor, so what? So what if it's a metaphor? It's still emphasizing the fact that God is my father that I am his child. That, that, that's making my point. It's emphasizing it, making it bigger than big. And Paul says, he's our father. So, um, we're, uh, you know, what about Jesus? What was Jesus' um, thought patterns towards God? Did he just think that he was this big God or what? Look at Matthew chapter one. What does the Bible say? Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ happened this way. I wouldn't think that this is a metaphor. 
is literally true. His mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child. How? By the Holy Spirit. So the question is, how did that happen? He was, she was found to be with child. Did God literally plant his seed in Mary? Does God have seed? I don't know. God is Holy Spirit. Or did he create a seed? Because he set the laws of conception up way at the beginning, right? One sperm, one ovum. They meet, got a baby, right? One sperm, one, one ovum. That's the law of conception. So, and he's the one that set the law. So there had to be a sperm involved, you know, or, and there was an ovum. So he either created that sperm or was it his sperm? Well, no, I don't think it was his sperm. He created that sperm within Mary's fallopian tubes. She was with child by the Holy Spirit. Now Joseph, her husband, being righteous, yet not will, wanting to, to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But while he was thinking about these things, look, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to favorably accept Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. So whatever God did, he caused conception to take place within Mary, right? He either, he either gave his own personal seed, his essence, or he created a seed within her, which I think is the more logical answer to that. But so either way is God the father of Jesus Christ whether it was his own personal seed or whether he created seed within her. Certainly, he is the father. Um, what, how did Jesus respond to it? Well, we look at Matthew chapter uh, 3. Just one example. Uh, oh, this is what God says from Matthew chapter 3 at the baptism of Jesus Christ in verse 16. <laughs> and when Jesus had been baptized immediately as he stepped away from the water, look, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And look, a voice came out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's what God said. This is my beloved son. This is my son, my huios, my my uh, niño, <laughs> my mijo, mijo, you know, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. That was God's testimony of Jesus. And what was Jesus' testimony of God in Matthew chapter 11? Um... Verse 25. I'll find it here. Oops, got to turn a page. Now that doesn't make sense. Oh, yeah, it does. Here, Jesus prays to the Father. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. That what verse, are you there? Verse 25 of chapter 11. I thank you, O Lord. I mean, I thank you, O oh Father, Lord of heaven. What else, there's many, many places in the Gospels where Jesus Christ addresses God as his Father. His Father. He didn't, you know, and he's not using a metaphor here. He's speaking literally, O oh Father. It's a, he's not using a metaphor. He's speaking literally that God is his Father. God spoke literally that this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, right? Those are not metaphors. Those are literal statements. Um, so what is being conveyed, if we say, if we concede, which I'm not, I am not advocating that we do. I'm trying to make an argument, 
a, a logical argument. If we concede that father is a metaphor, like all these other words are metaphors, what is the metaphor saying? The metaphor is then emphasizing the attributes of a father to God and emphasizing the relationship that we have with him. It is as a father, but I believe that it is literally true, and we're going to see why. So, uh, you know, Paul says that God, that in Philippians 1, 2, talks about God being our father, um, the fa you know, grace to you and peace from God, our father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, we know what that is all about because we've all had a father. We, we understand that, you know, you could go to your father and ask anything. We also understand the discipline of a father, but we understand the love of a father. We understand, too, that in that familial relationship, you were accepted as a part of that family. Um, you didn't have to work for acceptance. You know, Rob was a woods. He knew that he was a woods. Um, Doug was a Campbell. He knew that he was a Campbell. He didn't have to fight for that relationship. He didn't have to work for that, that acceptance into the family. Approval was a different thing. We, we did have to work for approval. We wanted our parents' approval. We didn't always get them. I'm sure Stacy's daughter doesn't always rise to the occasion of Stacy's approval. But acceptance, you know, if she does something bad, does Stacy say, ha, ah, you're no longer my child? You have to work to become my child again. You're no longer my child. No, because the acceptance is always there. The approval is something that has to be worked for. And, and, and we all work to be approved of our parents. We want to work to be approved of God too. But acceptance, no, because he's our father and because we are his children. So what started me on all of this was First Peter. And that's where we're going. First Peter, chapter one, verse twenty-three. Okay, for you have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the living and enduring Word of God. First Peter, chapter one, verse twenty-three. Yep, chapter one, verse twenty-three. For you have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Through, 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 the word is, the Greek word is dia. It means by way of or through. Um, like dia and via, by way of, through the, the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass. and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Okay. It's been said that, well, the word is the seed that is born within you. That's ludicrous. That is really poor research. This, these verses don't even allude to that. That's not even reading plain English. It says, you have been born again, not of corruptible seed. One of the arguments there is this word seed, because the word seed here is spora, not sperma. Two, two different Greek words that is used for seed. Generally speaking, the word sperma is used for offspring, your seed, your, you know, your offspring. But here is a very unique usage of the word spora which we get spore from, uh, you know, that seed. Spore from, from plants falls on the ground and produces more plants. This is the only time in the New Testament that this noun is used. The verb is used several times. Most of the time that the, not, the verb is used, it's used of sowing seed, like wheat, grain. Okay, it's used of that. In fact, in the parables where, uh, you know, Jesus is talking about that the seed was the word, that's, that is, a, a, talks about spora there. I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, 
Here is a unique usage though. Peter's the only one that uses this word spora for seed. And so what we have to do, Betsy and, and Doug and Rob and Michelle and Stacy, is ask the question, why does Peter use the word spora here in First Peter and not the word sperma, which we would expect him to use? Why is he, why is he making a point of using spora? seed that is broadcast or, or that type of thing. Well, what you'll find out is that the two words are somewhat interchangeable, depending on what you are speaking about. Um, here, he's making a contrast between a corruptible seed, like the grass that withers away. He's making a distinction between that kind of seed that is corruptible versus this seed, this spora that we have that is incorruptible. The, emphasis, the, the impact of these verses is talking about the incorruptibility of the seed that we have. So he uses the word spora because spora is corruptible, right? Look at first, hold your finger here, look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians. Now, find 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26. I said they're interchangeable. This will show you. Um, yeah. No, that can't be 1 Corinthians 15. That's not the right verse. Oh, 36, verse 36. Verse 36. You senseless one, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow uh, the body that will be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body and goes on. This word sow is a form of sperma. And he's talking about seed that you sow into the ground, right? So he's drawing an analogy here. And, he, and Paul uses the word sperma for seed here. So the two words, sperma and spora, can be used interchangeably. Uh, that, and that makes sense because we could do the same in English. It depends on what they're trying to emphasize, what, what point they're trying to draw here. So, but if that is true of seed. If any of you have ever grown a garden, I love cucumbers. I absolutely love fresh cucumbers right off the vine. And you take a seed of cucumber, cucumber seed, and you stick it in the ground. For that cucumber seed to produce a cucumber plant, the, the seed has to die. The, the, the seed has to corrupt. It has to decompose. And out of that seed then starts a plant. And that is the point that Peter is making. The seed that we have, is not like corruptible seed of the flesh, but it's incorruptible seed. It cannot die. It cannot go away. It's incorruptible. And that's the, that's the emphasis. That's the point that Peter's making. So here, if born again is a metaphor, as some say, I don't believe it is. I believe that the same way that God, basically, the same way that God gave birth to Jesus Christ, God gave new birth to us in that he gave us of his essence, Holy Spirit, okay? And that is seed within us. But if we say that it's a metaphor, I'm not the most expert person on figures, but if we say it's a metaphor, what is being emphasized? What's being emphasized is the seed of God in you that came through hearing the word of God is incorruptible. It is an incorruptible seed, and yet it is seed. And seed reproduces. Seed produces a plant. You know? So even if it's a metaphor, that person that wants to downplay the intensity of these words is actually making my point for me. They, it, God is now emphasizing the fact that we are born of him and that we are born in a way that cannot be corrupted, that cannot die. And it's 
in the way that we got it was through the living and enduring word of God. The word of God was the agent by which we got the seed. It wasn't the seed itself. It was the agent. Romans says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So, um, I think uh, pretty much that's it. We are God's children. He is our father. If it's a metaphor explaining the unique relationship we, we have having, that we have with him, or if it's literally true, it doesn't matter. The, the, tr the truth that's being spoken and emphasized is still the truth and is still there. Um, that is what I wanted to share. It's great to have a father, especially one like God. <laughs> so, okay. questions. Question, okay. question number one. Well, first of all, I take issue with one thing. Whether it's a metaphor or not a metaphor kind of does matter to me, and maybe my perspective on this is incorrect. Here's why I feel this way. Every time somebody says to me, and a lot of friends that I have that are Catholic will say this to me, and then also just people I know, when I talk about speaking in tongues, when I talk about manifestations, when I talk about um, Jesus Christ actually coming through the air to get us up from the dead. Um, if these things didn't actually truthfully happen, then as far as I'm, and people are telling me some of these things are metaphors or just a story in order to explain something then what the heck power do I have in this life right now? If I can't, that, are you telling me then, I want to pray to God and have power. I mean, are you saying that I can't literally get healed or I can't? Oh, no. So then my question is, some of this or a lot of this, as far as the Gospels, better be true, actual, literally happened. Otherwise, are you, then you're saying I can't actually speak in tongues. I can't actually get born again. I'm not actually going to watch Jesus come in the clouds. I'm not actually going to go from having a disease to not having a disease. To me, what someone is telling me is this is a story. It's not actually true. And that makes me feel like I have no power in this life. If that's, if, if I'm making my point clear. So I want to believe that. Uh, hopefully I can believe that. I want to have power when I pray. I want to talk to an actual father, God, and think he's actually hearing me. That's not just a metaphor. That's, um, I'm not trying to be facetious. That's no, I, under I understand what you're saying, Betsy. And, and maybe I didn't make myself clear enough. But no, all, all of the scriptures are literally true. You know, they're, it's all true. They're, Yes, you can speak in tongues. Yes, you have power. Yes, you can pray to God and he listens to you and he hears you. All of that, yes. It is, when you talk about a metaphor, you're not saying that it's a story. You're not saying that, well, this is a story being used to, you know, kind of say this or explain that. The metaphor is the usage of the word. For instance, we'll go back to the easy one. Um, all flesh is grass. That is a metaphor. It's saying, you know, it's literally true in the essence of what is being said. Flesh decays and dies. Grass grows and withers away, right? Those are true. It, the metaphor is just taking the attributes of one and equating it to the other. So, the reason I said, so what, if it's a metaphor, the reason that it's so what, I don't believe they are. Uh, some of them could be, you know, there's places in the scripture where you could make a case, okay, it's a metaphorical usage of the word. But even if it is, it's emphasizing the, the relationship between those two words. So um, uh, a citizen in heaven, okay? Is that literally true or is that metaphorically true? 
I, I, you know, I don't have a birth certificate uh, stating that I was born in heaven. Um, I don't have, you know, an address. Um, I don't. <laughs> am I really a citizen in the way that I understand a citizen? Well, what he's saying, what God is saying when he says that we're citizens of heaven, he's taking that which you understand about being a citizen of California and equating that to your relationship to him and the relationship to heaven. That just like you're a citizen in California, you have residence there, you, um, you know, you are... Um, subject to their laws, but you also are, have the privileges of any citizen in California. He's saying the same thing. You have all the privileges of being a citizen in heaven. Whether we're literally citizens or not is, is the question. Is that, is that literally true or is that metaphorically true? It doesn't really matter. What matters is, just like I'm a citizen of Ohio, and I enjoy the privileges and responsibilities of being a citizen of Ohio. I enjoy the privileges and the responsibilities as if I were a citizen in heaven. That's the impact. So what you were asking me, can I do all this? I want to know if this is true. It's, if it's a metaphor, it's even truer than true. It's even bigger than big. They're making my point. But can you see my concern? Yeah. My concern is all this academic talk makes me feel like the power of Jesus Christ is null and void in my life when the only thing we're concerned about is academics. Oh. And I, it's almost like I feel like because I don't understand some of this. I mean, the real purpose here to me is that I'm born again, that I tell other people about it, that actually have power to be healed in my life or manifest power. I mean, what other reason do we want this? I mean, if I talked all day long, about some new perspective on Paul. I, right. I, I mean, where's the power? And that's what it almost has made me feel like, well, that wasn't important, Betsy, because you are not smart enough to understand the academics here. Oh, but you are smart enough. Yeah, well, and I just want to know that the bottom line is, do academic people pray? Do they understand their power? Can they be healed? Or are we just going to figure out whether or not this is a figure of speech? It just seems like we're taking up time to take up time instead of getting to what God's business is. If, if we, um, by understanding what 1 Peter one twenty three says, it reinforces and strengthens my faith. It strengthens my position. It strengthens my belief by understanding it so that I'm, I'm not just relying on someone else. I want to understand it. And uh, when someone throws something at me that I'm like, I, can, I have two choices, three choices. I can agree with them. I can disagree with them. Or I can find out for myself. You know, I could just disagree with him. No, that goes against what I believe. Well, you know, that I could be right. I possibly could be wrong. Um, or I could find out for myself. And when I find out for myself, and like it says in Ephesians, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of your call. You know, that you may know it. And the only way you're going to know it is when you go to the scriptures and you understand it for yourself the great word um greek word called it's sunesis it's the word that's used for understanding it's a beautiful word and it is geographically that word is used for the point where two rivers come together and flow as one okay in gunnison colorado you have the east river and the taylor river and where the, those two rivers come together in the town or the city of Gunnison, and they form a new river called the Gunnison River. And then the Gunnison River and, uh, I forget what other river, join up in um, uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, and form the Colorado River. 
So that's that word synesis. When that happens in your brain, when, when two rivers of understanding, they come together and it, and it just flows and you go, wow, I understand this. I understand this. It's exciting. It's electrifying for you personally. I'm sure that's happened to you before. So I'm not trying to be academic at all. I'm not academic. Um, I'm the least academic. I, I, I don't even have a college degree. So, um, the, but I can still understand. And there's nothing wrong with, with studying the Bible, understanding it, so that you can, A, stop the mouths of the gainsayers. The Bible says to do that. And to understand so that you're not blown about by every wind of doctrine. I, I hope I'm, you know, I hope I'm getting through and I'm explaining it well. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking so that you guys. Yeah, I, I, I'm just going to say this one last thing. <laughs> I totally agree with you, but I will say if I listen to somebody long enough, I can really start to have doubt. And I began to realize, I began to realize it wasn't profitable for me. I started paying more attention to figuring out why I believe what I believe. I know what I believe, but I had to find out why I believe what I believe. And I have definitely done that. Uh, but still, to continuously listen to both sides all the time was completely not profitable for me. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, that's I, was just, I would just say I understand where you're coming from on that. Um, the uh, Sometimes the academic... If, 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 one of the things that Shane had said something the other day that I heard about when you're looking to, to understand the Bible, it really depends a lot on your trust in the teacher. Because when it comes to, when it comes to the word of God, really the depth and the way that you can study the word of God is, is almost infinite. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, there's lots of different ways to come approach it. And so you can, if you listen to somebody from an academic perspective, sometimes, uh, what's that old saying? If you can't dazzle them with brilliance, you baffle them with BS. <laughs> so, you know, you can, you can create so much confusion in a person's mind to persuade them towards your way of thinking. But, but on the other hand, you know, in that, in that verse in Corinthians that talked about, uh, let me read it to you here. Um, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his sub subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I mean, in my mind, the, the message of the gospel is really simple. It's real simple. It's not complicated. And when people try to put in all this complication, when they show you verses in the Bible and that, that you've accepted as being the truth, and they try to say, well, listen, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. You know, I just, I just in my own mind, the, the, the simplicity that's there in the gospel, the, of course, you know, I'm just going to say the way I understand it and the, and the teachers that I've trusted to teach it to me. When all this stuff comes together, it just, it, I just kind of want to shut it out. On the other hand, you do have to, you have to have a little bit of understanding of, of, of the way that you approach the Bible, like figures of speech and context, or remote context. I mean, you have to understand some of that stuff. You know, this verse that, that uh, Dennis covered today is a really, really important verse from, in going through these different arguments. First of all, the Trinitarians take this verse and try to say you can't be born of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, right? So it's a real Which important verse are you verse referring to? to? Yeah. What? Which verse are you referring to? Well, that in, uh, the, 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 in First Peter, okay. that about corruptible seed. We're born of, <clears throat> of incorruptible seed. Because the Trinitarians can't have the seed be the spirit either. The Trinitarians can't ha have to say the seed is the word of God. Because if the seed is the spirit, then it blows the whole doctrine of the Trinity out of the water. And the people that are in this continuing in the faith doctrine have to do the same thing. Because if the seed is the spirit, then it's, it's born in there, it's seed, it's, it's incorruptible. You can't uncorrupt it, you can't take it out, you can't remove it. And so 
the, the continuing the faith folks are trying to say that the seed is the word of God. But to me, it's like through Dennis's teaching and through simple reading, it's through the word of God. You know, whenever you hear uh, born of the seed of Abraham, born of the seed of David, born and seed go together. You're born of the seed. Seed and the word of God don't go together. And all the, all the, when you look at all the translations of this verse, it's always through the word of God. There's not some other way that you can change that word through into something else. So this is a, to me, this is an important verse. And when you, when you Google this verse, when you look at standard Christian writings of, of, or commentaries about this verse, they're all, they all relate it to the word of God. They all relate seed is the word of God. And that's because some of these commentaries and stuff all come from a Trinitarian perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, to me, it's, this is one of the key verses. It, and the people that are, that are doing the continuing in the faith program, this is one of the hardest verses they have to deal with. And, you know, I, I remember, because so I, I listened to Truett's explanation of his, his change of philosophy or his change of doctrine and stuff. And he goes, well, this is one of the hardest ones. But when I realized that seed was the word of God, then it made sense to me. Well, I'm the opposite. <laughs> I'm the opposite of that. To me, there's just, there, there's just no, hardly any other way. You can't ever interpret this verse any other way. That birth and seed go together. So anyway, I, I don't want to get too academic, but I just thank you. And I understand what you're saying, Betsy, but but the, don't don't you know don't be afraid of the academics. They're they're just you know they I see guys on TV that they when they do a show on Christianity, they bring in these professors, and I'm like you. Those professors, I don't think even believe. They don't believe in in salvation. They don't believe that Jesus really lived, that he was just some doofus from Nazareth, you know, who happened to be a spiritual guy. The, the, they don't believe it. But now, you know, there are some academic people who do believe they're very strong in their faith. But I think in academics, you get into the bubble of academiology where it's a big echo chamber where everything, you're never challenged on anything. And so you, you spend all these time, years and years of, of developing this doctrine in your head that nobody else can challenge because, you know, you're the, you're the supreme guy on the totem pole. But that's not, that doesn't scare me anymore. I challenge everything. I, I just don't, you know, to me, my own reading of the Bible is accurately interpreted. And I think that, that Shane Hyde's done a, as, as much as you can possibly do an accurate interpretation of the Bible. If you just read it yourself and don't listen to anybody else, you're way, way ahead. Do your own interpretation. Let the Holy Spirit that's in us tell us what this, what, how you fit this together. Yeah, and I'm going to admit right now, I think that's, because <coughs> what you're talking about, what you just said, you said, I, I question everybody. And I think that confidence that I need to, because I thought the same thing when you were talking about where they say it's the, it means the word. And I'm like, am I missing something here? <laughs> well, what, well, well, where did I get lost? I don't see that at all. And I heard the same thing, but I questioned myself. And I know that I, we just have to have confidence, like you said, confidence in what God promised us he will deliver, confidence. Um, I think we do have to be careful in, in who we choose to listen to a lot. You know, I mean, if absolutely. you listen to a certain thing over and over and over again from one, two, or three different teachers, and they're all saying the same thing, you know, and if you stop what you know to be true or, or stop listening to everybody else, you can be swayed. I mean, it's. I'm, and I, 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 I've done that actually, Rob. I'm yeah. not getting on all of that. I can't because it, even though I think I'm not being swayed, I'm questioning myself constantly. And it's I don't like It's good to know. I'm not saying we should never listen to anybody else because you can get good stuff from almost anyone. Yeah. But, you know, we need, we need to know the enemy, so to speak, uh, you know, know who you're up against. But, you know, uh, we just have to make sure that we listen to teachers we trust, you know, as, as Doug pointed out, there's really a lot to that. And the, the more you know your teacher, I think helps. I mean, 
the difference in uh, the way some of these academics present things versus the way somebody like Shane Height presents. I'm not saying Shane Height's not an academic. I mean, he's, he's obviously smart. But when you hear him talk about the Bible or quotes of Paul, he, he will say, God says this, and God says that, and, you know, this is the word of God. And some of these other people, well, the, Paul says this, and or the writer says this, and, and you got to interpret it in, in this way, and it's because it's a Greco-Roman biography that, you know, that's why it's written this way. And, you know, just the, the attitude of, of the Bible from the two different sides seems to be different. I agree. I mean, when I, one of the, when, when I finished listening to, to I don't know, three or four hours of the, of the Continuing the Faith Plus, reading the whole thing, my attitude, and, and listen, I got a lot of years in, a, in the academic environment, right? I add up all the years that I've been in school. Man, hmm. it's a lot, 15, some crazy, some crazy number. And I've been around these kind of people, intellectual bullies, you know, for, for my whole lifetime. So I don't know, I don't know get as afraid because I've seen all of these doctrines and these things that have been previously taught in, in both as from the science as well as the theological thing turn out to be wrong. I mean, you think of, think of those, those of us who are in the way, the, the doctrines that were taught then, some of them, a lot of them were great. I mean, I, I, I owe my salvation to the way, you know, but, but there were doctrines that were taught by academics at that time that looked like they were academics that turned out to be wrong. And so you just always have to be, I think, aware and studying and, and don't put your confidence in men because men are fallible and you get somebody that you really like and you come you become mesmerized by them and you and you start accepting everything they say and then they disappoint you at some point in your life and you when you get a lot of gray hair like me there's been a half a dozen people teachers and things that i've had that have disappointed me in some way you know you find out that they're sexually immoral or they're financially corrupt or you you know you you find out something as time goes by, you say, how can that happen? How can that person be so successful? How can they have all these things, all these houses and cars and stuff like that or something? And then five years later, they're totally bankrupt. You know, so I don't know. I'm, I'm, my point there is about putting our faith in a man. Uh, you just got to be careful. Yeah. I'll confess that, you know, even when I hear John Shane High teach, I, I think it now, okay, is that, is that true? Does that make sense with what he said before? And what about this verse? Does that all fit together? You know, I'm always being, listen with a critical ear. And not, not critical as in the sense of putting them down, but critical is, is he right? Absolutely. It's yeah. not that you don't like the person. A lot of people that disagree with me, I like. You know, I, I think, well, they're really nice people, but they're not, they just don't, they don't, believe the same thing I believe. So God bless them, they'll work it out. And, and I really think that the, 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 the people who are, who, and there's a lot of people who believe in continuing the faith. The entire Catholic religion believes in that, right? So there's a lot of people who believe in, believe in that. But when I listen to the, to the teachings about that, they conflate our earthly life with our future life. They conflate, uh, well, I don't want to, of salvation of eternal our salvation of eternal life versus being saved uh, from a shipwreck. You know, it's it's a it's and it all gets jumbled together. You know, we have two lives, right? And we potentially have two deaths. And so we just want to avoid the second one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think what all, all of you said is actually is definitely true we have to be we have to you have to listen to me with a critical mind i'm not the know all the end all to end all not by any means i love sharing the scriptures i love going to the scriptures and trying to understand them to me that's the most fun game to play you know a lot of people like to play cards other people like to play board games 
to me, the most fun game is opening up the books and searching out for myself what this verse is saying or what this topic is all about. Um, with any serious teacher, anyone that's serious about sharing the scriptures needs to understand two things very quickly. And they're very sobering, sobering things. One is, uh, I think it's in James, where it says, you know, hey, don't rush off to the desire to be a teacher because the teachers are going to be held to a greater judgment. And that's true. Those that teach God's word are going to be held to a stricter judgment. And the other one is Jeremiah chapter 23. It says, woe be to the shepherds that scatter my flock. You know, um, so that's a very sobering thing. You know, I, I don't want woe. Whatever woe is, I don't want any of it. You know, um, and so I, I try to be as careful as I know how to be. That's like, I didn't tell you what I thought a metaphor was. I'll read you from the, I'll read straight from the, the professor on that, the man that, you know, knows more about figures of speech than any other person I think had ever been alive, uh, other than maybe Jesus himself. And uh, we can build trust in people. And, you know, not everything that everybody teaches is always going to be 100% true because we're fallible human beings. But you can know the person's heart, you can know the person's integrity, and you can end up trusting a person um, and then the nice thing within STF and our community is we can always call each other on the carpet and we can always question each other. And then that's good because if I just, if I said something that was wrong today, I want Doug or Rob or Betsy or Stacy or, or Michelle or George to point it out to me. I want it pointed out to me because I don't want to be wrong again. I want to understand correctly. I think you want the same thing, but the word of God has been attacked by the adversary for ever since Genesis 3.15. You know, it's been, it, the adversary has attacked the truth nonstop. And so we can't just let those attacks drop on the floor uh, unnoticed. Right. We have to stand for the, for the truth. You know, it's interesting that, um, Many young women, especially uh, men too, but the the um, study was done concerning young women who are are um, becoming Muslim. It's an astounding amount of people at an astounding rate. The young women that are no, they don't want to go to the church that their parents went to. They're going to become Muslim. They're going to follow Islam. And when asked why, the the uh, main reason given what it was um, because they stand for something. They actually believe something and stand for it. And Christians tend to be wishy-washy and milk toast and, you know, um, and, you know, um, The church, the Christian church, has is running down a pathway, and they'll arrive there. Many already have of called universalism, where we're all God's children. We all believe in God. We just approach Him a different way. Whether you're Shinto, or Hindu, or Buddhist, or Apache, you know, we're all children of God. Called universalism universalism um the catholic church is really heading that direction and you know we can't be like that we have to stand for something stand for the truth what does the scripture say and then stand for that and not be blown about by every wind of doctrine but i think i'm going to stop the recording at this point